definitely apologize for folks sitting in the waiting room. We Y'all were not popping up. Uh, I'm <coughs> Tiffany Linfield, and I'm with Memphis Free Thought Alliance, and uh, we are hosting a lecture today on animal rights uh, by Ms. Tracy Glover, and she will introduce herself. She's a great lady, done a lot of good work for the environment and animals. She will introduce her film. We will watch her film. It's a new film. Um, it's 30 minutes, and then she will answer any questions anybody may have, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So I will hand it back to you, Tracy, as the host. Okay. You are on record. Okay. Make host. All right. Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, sorry again for keeping you waiting waiting room oh wait we've got somebody else it looks like in the waiting room so let me try to so i'm trying to admit here we're good um, and when folks aren't talking it's a good idea to mute yourself I, i'm not sure if i know how to do that oh here let's see you should be able to like at the bottom of your screen there should be a mute mute button right, I can, you see it you got it you got it um so okay so um first of all i am just going to my disclaimer is that um we were just talking about i have 13 cats and three dogs and so uh, um, and i have no control over any of them so so uh they might decide to try to get in on this call and so any um uh, uh, apologies in advance for any interruptions um so uh, thank you so much for um, joining today um, and uh, uh, giving me a little time. Um, I think that Tiffany initially asked me to, um, to do this presentation. Uh, we were, I was just gonna do a regular talk on animal rights. And um, in the meantime, I released uh, short documentary that I've been working on. Sparky, Sparky, relax. So I'm sorry. Yeah, I think um, if everybody could just put themselves on mute, you know how to do that. It's What's not, up with you, Hershey? Jason, um, can you mute yourself? I, there we go. <laughs> I think. We're, oh my gosh. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Hold on one sec. This is. This is. <laughs> So as I warned, did everybody just hear that cat fight? Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, I was planning just to do a sort of a talk on animal rights, but I just released this short documentary. And so it felt like just the, uh, uh, you know, good opportunity to the film. And then we can talk about it afterwards because it covers uh, so many issues. Like, you know, talking about animal rights, it's like when, again, when Tiffany first asked me to speak, I was like, well, is there a certain aspect of animal rights that you want me to talk about? And she just said, you know, animal rights. Um, but there are, but there are so many, so many aspects to animal rights, um, from um, you know, farmed animals to animals in experimentation to animals in entertainment, um, and um, just many different approaches. And I, 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 in most of what I do, I focus primarily on farmed animals um, because it's the farmed animals that have um, uh, the fewest legal protections who are harmed in the largest numbers and to the greatest degree. Um, and so that has led me to really focus more and more on animal agriculture. But the more I've looked into animal agriculture, um, although it started off as being really from a purely animal rights perspective, um, it's, you know, led me to, it's like the more, you know, the more research you do, the more you realize that animal agriculture is not only, um, it, you know, it's just extremely harmful um, to the animals um, and, and responsible for an, an incredible degree of suffering that's really unparalleled in, in our world. Um, but animal agriculture is also responsible for most of, if not all of, uh, our major environmental problems like climate change and water and air pollution. Um, animal agriculture also, basically it's just a model of exploitation. And so animal agriculture as an industry, especially industrialized agriculture, but not exclusively industrial animal agriculture, 
you know, exploits the animals, exploits the environment, and it exploits humans, um, particularly the workers. Um, one thing my film doesn't get into really at all is the impact of animal agriculture on our health, but that's a whole other issue which also has um, justice components to it. Um, and, and the film looks a little bit at, the, at some of the environmental justice issues to, to animal agriculture, like the fact that um, factory farms are almost exclusively found in underserved minority um, communities that don't have the political power to keep them out. Um, and having a factory farm in your backyard basically destroys your whole community um, and also increases your risk of a number of um, diseases and again, that, that disproportionately affects marginalized communities. But the same is true of the health impacts of um, consuming animal products. So we know that, so just again, the film doesn't really talk about this a whole lot, but um, consuming animal products is really linked to pretty much all of the major um, diseases of affluence, um, which are those diseases that primarily affect us in developed nations like cancer, diabetes, um, heart disease. The sorts of, they're, they're really the sorts of diseases that I think I grew up thinking were genetic um, and not realizing how lifestyle driven they in fact are. But those are also the diseases of affluence. They, they um, disproportionately, again, affect uh, communities of color, minority communities. And that's not accidental. Like a lot of that has to do with, um, you know, targeting those communities for fast food and, um, um, you know, other, other animal products. Um, so um, there's just so many issues uh, when we talk about animal rights and then you look at animal agriculture and then as you get into animal agriculture, you know, you just start to realize how many issues intersect um, at that point. And so, um, so before showing the film, I guess just like a tiny bit of background just on where I'm coming from um, and who I am. I um, first went vegetarian for the animals when I was like 16 and um, then went back and forth for like 15 years um, before just 15 years ago approximately now um, committing to being fully vegan and um, during so I'm trying to think so, uh, as I was like in college I was probably back and forth and um, I worked for a while as a uh, rescue and cruelty officer for the Humane Society, um, always just really loved animals and cared about animals. Um, but then I ended up going to law school. And when I went to law school, I wasn't really sure there were just so many, there's so many, you know, the world has so many problems and there are so many people and that need help and so many different causes that need help. And I felt when I was getting out of college, I felt kind of overwhelmed with, um, you know, just all the, like, where, who, who was I going to help? Like, what was the cause I was going to choose? There were so many just so many causes, so many worthy causes. And so when I went to law school, I sort of thought like, well, everybody can use a lawyer. So I'll go to law school. And when I, you know, by the time I'm out of law school, I will find my cause. And um, I, in law school, I primarily studied international refugee law um, and constitutional law. And um, I did my internships um, working for international refugee organizations. And if I hadn't ended up really deciding to focus my attention on um, animals and primarily farmed animals, it's probably the, in, uh, probably an international refugee community that I would have focused on. And primarily my focus was on women, um, uh, women refugees, on women fleeing from gender-based persecution. Um, but um, just over time, you know, the more I read, the more I saw, the more I felt that the animals, um, they have fewer advocates than anybody. And again, the numbers are, are mind blowing. Um, and I, I always hesitate a little bit to give the numbers because I'm gonna, I always uh, bastardize these quotes, but there's the quote like one person, uh, like a million people is a statistic, one, what, what, do you know this quote I'm talking about? I knew I would do this. Uh, one person is a tragedy, one million is a statistic. I think that's it. And um, with the animals, we talk about factory farming or talk about farm, industrial farming in this country alone, we kill 10 billion animals, um, land animals, just land animals. If you, if you start including fish, we get into the trillions. So in this country alone, every year, we kill 10 billion land animals for food. 10 billion. And those animals 
have almost no legal protections and their suffering is immense. And the thing is like with other, it's, it, I mean, there are so, again, there are so many worthy causes, um, uh, but, but this one gets overlooked. Um, you know, I think in the world that we're living in today, I mean, you know, we, we see more than ever the major flaws in our society and how many communities are overlooked and exploited and um, uh, marginalized. Um, but, um, you know, you, you just even bring animals into a conversation about social justice, a lot of people won't even have that conversation. And like, why not? They're sentient beings. They, they suffer and they have a central nervous system like we do. Like they have the capacity to feel physical pain like we do. And, and anybody who's ever been around a dog or a cat, you know, had a pet, had an emotional relationship with an animal and hopefully, can, I know, we can't see everybody, but like other people who are on video, who, who has a, a companion animal or has ever had a companion animal? I have three rescue dogs. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, anybody who's ever been around or, you know, had a relationship with a, um, with a non-human animal, like a dog or a cat, knows that they have um, a, a complete emotional range, you know, that they have the capacity to experience joy. You know, you, you know when they're happy, like a dog wags his tail when he's happy, right? And they have the capacity to suffer. And the farmed animals are no different. Um, it's a cultural idea. Um, you know, in some countries, they eat dogs. And we in the West often fall into these really racist um, attacks on those on those um, communities. And, you know, we like to call them barbaric for eating species like dogs and cats. And yet we eat equally intelligent, equally sentient beings in our own culture. Um, so I tried in this, when I decided to make this film, I, by then, so I had, I left my, I left my law career and I, um, had uh, decided by then to really focus on animals. I started a, an animal rights group in Mobile, Awakening Respect and Compassion for All Sentient Beings. There's kind of like a sister organization in Memphis that Tiffany um, leads. Um, and uh, and then you'll see in the film, actually, I ended up to um, starting a, a little micro sanctuary for chickens, for rescued chickens. Chickens were rescued from the um, from animal agriculture. Um, and uh, I've just always been really searching for you know how to how to contribute as much as possible to this cause and it's hard to figure out because it's such a big problem and it's like you know wanting to change society um and um so a few years back i was trying to figure out like what i could do to have more of an impact and i decided i wanted to make a film because there's so many documentaries i just you know documentaries are just so powerful and um i have been so impacted by so many um and i've always been really interested in film I sh uh, you know i have no regrets having a lot of degrees like a great um it's just you know it's a great education to have but i also have like a ton of debt and if i could do it again i'd probably go to film school um but um so i started working on this film about five years ago and it like evolved a lot and then i ended up having to shelve it several times and I think it's probably pretty typical, but it took me like five years to end, to end up putting together what's um, a short. I initially um, was planning to put together a short film to use for um, grant seeking purposes and in order to make a feature length film. And I just have ended up leaving it as a short, but I tried in this film to bring in, you know, um, oh, we have another person waiting. I'm sorry here, I'm admitting. Melanie, I hope hope this will get Melanie to join us. Do we see, I think it looks like everybody's in. So I'm sorry to Melanie, I hope you weren't waiting long. I just noticed that you were um, in the waiting room. So um, yeah, yeah, and also for anybody who like joined late, um, I'm, so I'm Tracy Glover and um, Tiffany had invited me to speak on animal rights. And then it just so happened that I ended up releasing this short documentary that I had done in the interim. So instead of just doing like a typical talk, we thought we would show the film and then we can talk about it afterwards. Um, so what we're gonna try to do is I'm going to try to um, share my screen and um, play it full screen. And then we can just watch from my screen. But I'm also going to, in a minute, I will try to, um, Let's see if I can figure out how to, um, 
I, I'm just gonna try to share the link um, in the chat bar of our Zoom in case in case anybody has a hard time. Oh, now I can't get back. Hold on. Um, in case anybody has a hard time watching it off my screen and hopefully won't, but um, I'm just not entirely sure what the video quality will be. So there, I just typed in the, the link to the film in case you wanna um, watch it from your own screen or watch it later or share it. Um, so unless anybody has any questions or comments before we start, I'll just go ahead and switch over to a sh shared view and start the film and then um, we can discuss it afterwards. And it's again, it's about, I think it's about 34 minutes. It's good. All right, here we go. This is the story of a civilization with all the tools to be peaceful and harmonious, to create a world where all beings are treated with respect and kindness, where all beings can thrive and enjoy the miracle of being alive. But who instead have created hell on earth for numerous beings who have created a society filled with inequality, injustice, discrimination, suffering, disease, poverty, warfare, and who with full knowledge are destroying our one and only planet. If you would look at any problem in the world right now, anyone, you know, nationalism, um, racism, uh, sexism, um, any, any ism in the world is basically the product of separation and supremacy. And the subtext of every meal also is that certain beings are superior and others are inferior. So there's this basic sense of entitlement, uh, basic sense of might makes right, those who are strong can use and abuse and exploit those who are less powerful. And so when we see injustice like racism and sexism and ableism and heterosexism and human trafficking and classism and all the ways that we human beings have uh, found to uh, exploit each other, to oppress each other, to use each other, abuse each other, um, underneath that is this constant and, and the ongoing violence towards animals for food and other products where we abuse them in the same way and have the same attitude of superiority, the same attitude of disconnectedness, uh, the same attitude of reductionism, of reducing them to commodities uh, that, that don't have feelings. We don't sympathize with them. We learn essentially to harden our hearts. My mother grew up on, grew up on a farm. And so she was pretty hardened and about animals because she grew up on a dairy farm and she had a pet calf, probably about the same age as Lucas. And she loved him. And one day she went to school and she came home and her brothers and father were beating him onto a truck and hitting him and taking his tail and twisting it. And she said, what are you doing? Stop, don't hurt Georgie. And they said, you just, you can't have a cow as a pet. He's an animal and we're gonna eat him. And so they took him to the, and slaughtered him and then served him for dinner. When I first came to her as a child and, and somebody told me that 
meat with animals. And I said, I don't want to eat that anymore. I was maybe like six years old. And she got really angry and she said, you have to eat it. That's what we're you know, going to have here and you're not going to not eat that. And so I kind of just like repressed that for many years. And then when I became older, obviously started meeting more animals. I always loved animals. But I was one of those people who loved animals and still ate them. It, there's not, there's nothing natural about eating meat. It's, um, you know, when I was in Korea, people thought it was natural to eat dog. It's all culturally, culturally determined. We are a product of our community. There's not really any rational basis for discriminating between a cow or a cat or a dog. It's just cultural norms that have caused us to do that. The point being that the kinds of animals that here, for instance, that we raise in intensive confinement out of view and then put in our plates um, are no less sentient or worthy of living and worthy of respect than animals who we cherish as household pets. You know, we're trading everything that is most important to animals against something that is almost mind-numbingly inconsequential for humans. And we're saying that the human momentary pleasure outweighs the you know, heretical cruelty and exploitation and killing of animals. A just society has to include everyone. And as the philosophers have shown, those who must be included is anyone who is affected by the behaviors, by the choices. So it would be all sentient beings. And without that, you can't have a just society. I talked to the folks who were in my life, um, and they just were like, okay, but you know, people are getting shot in the streets, and you know, we're dealing with police brutality and, and, and discrimination and the prison system and all of this. And you're talking about animals? A lot of people in the industry want to be able to say, well, that's just one bad apple. That's, that's not representative of the entire industry. But what we're finding is that undercover investigation after undercover investigation is routinely uncovering abuses that demonstrate that animal cruelty is standard practice. The worst industries are the chicken flesh industry, the fish industry, and egg industry. The suffering of the chicken industry and the egg industry and the fishing industry, especially aquaculture, uh, is really beyond pretty much anybody's worst imaginings. You look down in there and it's like a gravy that's simmering <laughs> and squirming. <laughs> Chickens are the most abused land animal on Earth. Of the 10 billion land animals we kill in the U.S. for food every year, 9 billion are chickens, and they have virtually no legal protection. They are even exempt from the Humane Slaughter Act. Whether raised for eggs or meat, animal agriculture deprives them of the most basic joys of being alive and denies them all natural behaviors, including seeing the light of day. In January of 2019, an industrial chicken farm in Colorado went bankrupt. They turned off the heat and stopped feeding the 40,000 birds in their care. Local sanctuaries found out and put out a call for help. They pulled as many birds as they could find homes for. In total, over 600 were rescued by brave, compassionate activists and then transported to sanctuaries across the country. I happened to see what was going on on Facebook and decided to convert my old shed into a makeshift coop, which was the beginning of my own sanctuary. So I've been vegan for about 15 years before I first uh, took in any chickens. And until then, I knew about the horrible suffering that they endure. That's part of why I went vegan to begin with. But even as a 15 year vegan, I still believed many of the convenient misconceptions society tells us about um, the species. I think I believed they were probably kind of stupid. Um, I think I hoped they were too stupid to suffer somehow. Um, 
And I also don't think I realized they were really capable of having individual personalities. <laughs> um, and uh, just like on a daily basis, I'm astounded and um, um, charmed uh, by their amazing little personalities. They're all unique. Um, some of them like to be snuggled and held. Some of them will come just begging for attention. Uh, Leela and Mitra like to jump on your shoulder. Um, Sandy likes to be held and snuggled. Eleanor likes to be held and snuggled. Um, Becky was one of the original uh, Colorado rescues. She got to me with a compound fracture and had to have her wing amputated. And um, she lived, she spent the night in the house for about a year. And uh, so she'd go outside during the day in her own separate yard, and then she'd come in at night. And um, she knew the routine so well. As soon as you opened up the door to her enclosure, she would uh, run up the back stairs of the porch and go in the house and run back to her bedroom and put herself in her little kennel. They're all individuals, just like our dogs and cats. But as a species, they are just incredibly social gentle, curious, smart. I had no idea what amazing little people they were. I think most people don't. So I don't want to make light of, of the cruelty of the beef industry. The animals are branded without pain relief. It's third degree burns. It's excruciating. Uh, they'll have their horns ripped out of their heads, uh, castrated without pain relief. Castrated is a pretty antiseptic term, right? Their, their testicles are ripped out of their scrotums without pain relief. Slaughter is excruciating. The trip to slaughter is excruciating. But all of that, and all of it would warrant felony cruelty charges if these were dogs or cats. Um, all of that is still significantly less than the unmitigated misery that categorizes the life of a farmed fish or a farmed broiler chicken or a farmed egg-laying hen. Uh, those three animals are in chronic and excruciating pain for their entire lives. And the slaughter of those animals is even worse than the slaughter of cattle and pigs. So if people stop eating red meat and they substitute birds and fish from an animal protection standpoint, uh, that is literally exponentially worse. It's not just worse, it's exponentially worse. I think the dairy and egg industry creates more suffering for the animals than even the meat industry. With cows especially, they are so bonded to their babies and that's why I think the dairy industry is one of the absolute worst because the mother cows don't get to be with their babies at all just for a few minutes and then they're taken away always because they want all the milk to go to humans. And when we were in school and I was learning, I, I took a dairy management class and they told us that the babies have to be taken away immediately because otherwise the mothers will break down the, the barns to get to their babies because the bonding is so intense between a mother cow and her baby. These are cows who have been artificially inseminated and they are lactating as mammals, just like we are, they're lactating in order to feed their young. But because this is an industry where we want that milk to sell to humans, these babies are taken away, usually on their very first day of being born. When the babies are taken away, they're sent to another facility. And undercover footage of these animals shows that they are tortured and abused, just like all the other animals on factory farms. These, these are babies, day old, maybe two or three days old. They can barely even walk. 
And we investigated a facility that was picking up these cows from dairy factory farms and putting them on what they called a temporary calf raising facility where they were loaded on the trucks from the dairy factory farm and then unloaded into this temporary facility before they were then loaded back onto a truck and shipped somewhere else. And in this facility, it, the footage is so disturbing to watch and so heartbreaking because these are babies who can barely walk and in order to get them off the truck, because they can't walk, the workers are seen pulling them by their legs, by their tails, kicking them off of the trucks, dragging them around the facilities, and then they'll spend about a week there, and they're still very fragile. These are such sensitive, fragile animals. They can still barely walk, and in order to load them on the truck as fast as they want to, they will often pick them up and throw them onto the trucks on top of each other. In some of the cases, they didn't even land on the truck and they fell in front of the truck. And it is, they're, they're treating them like you would treat garbage. I mean, it is, they are literally just treating them like these are not sentient beings, but these are baby cows. These are calves who want nothing more than to be with their mothers. I've always been somebody who um, was really motivated to fight for um, those who were more helpless or more vulnerable. You know, I'm very engaged in social justice movements from, you know, the, the um, anti-racism movement to um, LGBTQ plus movement to... Um, you know, the, the, the disability movement. And so I try to, to um, do what I can in, you know, sweatshop labor movement. Just, I want to be supportive and, and be a part of the solution to those issues and have for years. Um, and so finally seeing what was happening to animals and seeing them as maybe the most vulnerable um, community, the floodgates open. And in that moment, I connected. I really connected, and there was no turning back. I saw it everywhere at that moment. I would, everywhere I looked, I saw animal, animal use, animal exploitation, and it was just, it hit me from all these different directions. And I thought, I have to do something. I'm fighting for marginalized um, groups. So you have that dominant society that's always been there. And so we're just trying to take a small part of it by looking at food as a tool to help create social change and a more positive change in the world. Food justice is every aspect of the food supply chain. So and not causing harm to any sentient being. It also includes the disbursement of food, the equity of food, and who is getting the healthy food and those communities who aren't getting the healthy food. So it's really just taking a holistic view of the food system um, as it currently exists and really trying to right some of the wrongs um, and really honestly break down a system that's made of exploitation and oppression of living beings. When we look at the, the food system and animal agriculture, um, we look at the corporations who are basically fueling all of this, that they look at all beings, rather it be human or non-human animals, as commodities, as an ends to a means. When I am fighting for them, I'm fighting the injustice that is happening to them. The workers are exploited as well. Um, some do die in these systems, but more than not, we're talking about people of color, a lot who are immigrants, who are victims, um, women who are victims of sexual harassment um, and worse, um, as well as workers who are threatened um, with things like deportation, who, uh, when they speak out against abuses that are taking place, are threatened. The environmental justice issues, um, a, a lot of, you know, a lot of them, a lot of the ones that are related to uh, agribusiness um, are happening far away, are happening out, you know, in the middle of nowhere where, where people are living out um, in the country and these facilities are being built and polluting communities, uh, predominantly communities of color, um, poor communities of color, um, and so they're having all of these upper respiratory problems, they're having, you know, cancers that, that, that weren't uh, prevalent before. And so it does become an environmental justice issue because these 
these communities are clearly being targeted. I absolutely believe that veganism is necessary for a just society. I think that veganism is a start. I definitely think we need to widen our circle of compassion for those of us who are vegans. We always want human animals to extend that circle of compassion to, to recognize um, non-human animals, which I absolutely agree with. But we as vegans and animal activists need to understand that we too need to expand that circle of compassion to include human animals. Fundamentally, sitting behind it all, there is a structure that holds certain type beings over others, and they become the oppressors, and then there's the oppressed. We think that we, as humans, are entitled to not only rule the planet, but to exploit it. Look at the results of that. We are on the verge of ecological collapse. Animal agriculture is a significant contributor to global climate change. So anywhere from between 14 and a half to perhaps 18 percent, maybe even slightly more of global greenhouse gas emissions caused by human activity are directly attributable to the livestock sector. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization came out with this very seminal report called Livestock's Long Shadow in 2006. And that really set a very strong research agenda basis. Um, and their conclusion was, you know, the livestock sector is closely linked to the most pressing environmental problems throughout the world, from water pollution to deforestation to climate change. And it needs to be addressed in that a central uh, aspect of public policy. And when you're talking about the people that get hit are even the most vulnerable. And so it's coastal cities and countries and near the equator, and then also just vulnerable populations don't have backup safety systems. So the realities of climate change are a huge issue around, or a huge set of issues, but, but principally around justice and equity. Climate change has been caused by the rich nations of the world, but in historically what we called the global north. It's not fair for us to say in the global north, well, we, you know, we destroyed our forests. We polluted the atmosphere with fossil fuels. We uh, destroyed a lot of agricultural land. And now you people in India, in China, and Brazil, and Paraguay, and Papua New Guinea, you really can't do it because there's not enough climate space. There's not enough resources. The emergence of factory farm factory really push uh, a much higher level because meat has never been so cheap in human history. And, and that is the one thing that we, we, most people never thought of is why and how can meat be so cheap? I mean, if you think about it, after all, meat used to be life. So the question is, how could life be so cheap? on this path we're on, a path of greed, selfishness, indifference, xenophobia, racism, sexism, ableism, heterosexism, misogyny, environmental destruction, and speciesism, a path that is leading to the destruction of our civilization and ultimately the destruction of our truly miraculous life-giving planet. Or we can wake up from the delusion of separation and superiority that imprisons us in our own small world and cuts us off from the whole of life of which we are an integral part. We can learn to live with awareness and in harmony with the truth of our inner connection with all life. We can choose compassion and fairness, equality, kindness, and justice. We can choose peace. Our survival now depends on our willingness and ability to see that we are all connected and that all of the problems we face as a world are connected. We must look deeply to see the root causes of suffering, to see that the way that we treat all beings, especially the most vulnerable, that we will all it's a big challenge to see the world as one. And again, not only do you think of the human species. I grew up in the projects, and I never saw animals, um, except for the animals that we're at odds with. 
you know, I saw rats, you know, I saw insects, um, I saw the occasional sparrow and like, you know, every once in a while, but it was concrete, it was asphalt, it was bricks everywhere, and, and these aren't really environments that are conducive to, to, to wildlife. I didn't see any of that, and, and, and growing up that way, you know, mic? just to the actual planet that we live on. I thought that the environment was somewhere else. When I grew up, you know, and I would hear this word environment, I, honestly, I thought that it was somewhere where, like, white people went to, like, be in the woods and, and I don't know, fish and, and shoot animals. I, I, you know, like, this is, this is what I thought the environment was. I didn't know <laughs> that I was actually living in an environment. One of my goals is to help to reconnect to the planet itself by just having your hands in the earth. You know, we, we adopted these abandoned lots and we, we put gardens on them and then we invite the community to come out and just put your hands in the dirt. The kids just took to it and they just wanted to be involved. And, you know, they saw a praying mantis for the first time and they were like, oh my gosh, like this is an amazing insect. And they all wanted to like, you know, come over and see the praying mantis. They, you know, some of them saw slugs for the first time or worms for the first time or, you know, a butterfly. Because butterflies don't really come into the hood. There's nothing green, you know? And because we were building this environment, these animals were start suddenly coming into the environment and these children were seeing these animals for the first time and they were amazed and they were excited and then I was able to you know, connect them back to the natural world, which they had never, for some of them, had never had before. Given that animals are sentient, how might that affect our relations with them? Well, just some fundamental ways. We need to respect them, and that means to give them their space. We need to allow them to live normal lives. We need to stop caging them. Uh, we really, in my view, we need to stop shipping them to slaughter. We need to get rid of factory farms because about 98% of all the animals we kill are to be eaten. So dietary shifts are where it's at. That's the biggest and most significant impactful change that humans as individuals need to make to help animals and the planet and ultimately ourselves. Family farms are just a smaller version of a factory farm. All the same things are done. The animals are still killed when they're babies. The, uh, a lot of the chickens are still de-beaked. They still do a lot of the same awful practices, just on a smaller scale. I work with all of these animals, and I see them as individuals because they are individuals. We've learned to see them not as some abstract notion of a species, but we meet them and we learn to recognize them as individuals. When I see Vegan and Valentine, our Yorkshire pigs, and I see how they move and how funny and intelligent and amazing they are, I think about all of those pigs that live miserable lives in those gestation crates. calling of all religion is nonviolence. And I think that's true of secular humanism as well. Pretty much we can all agree that if we have two choices in front of us, and one of them is add to the level of mercy in the world, and one of them is add to the level of misery in the world, it's pretty basic to ethics and basic to religion that we go with mercy compassion or cruelty, we go with compassion. Like, that's what it means to be an ethical human being in the world, regardless of one's faith background. We all have the same fundamental essence, and, the same, and that fundamental essence is enlightened. That fundamental essence is loving, it's kind, it's compassionate. So then you apply that sort of basic understanding to what it is that we choose to eat. 
and you get into this situation where most people just haven't thought that much about it. But really, a vegan diet is the diet that aligns with the values that just about everybody already has the values. It's just uh, applying those values to our daily life. How do I feel about the future and my hopes for the future? Well, if I'm honest, I try not to. Because as an activist, I have a very immediate goal, and it's to do what I can do today. My life is so short, and ultimately, the only meaning my life can have is the change that I bring here, is how I touch others, how I touch the earth that I walk on. I'm very concerned about the future. I'm afraid that we're not gonna learn our lessons quick enough. We're running out of time. The cultural change happens really quickly. And I think we're approaching a tipping point. And, and frankly, climate change is part of that tipping point. It may be the very issue that brings us to our senses or possibly to our knees so that we realize we just can't run roughshod over the planet anymore. We need a new paradigm. And that may be the best thing to happen for the animals. I don't think we have a future if our future is not vegan. It's important for people to recognize the power of their food choices and that informed food choices can really do a lot to help change the wrongs in our society. What we say, of course, is eat your ethics. When we have the cumbersome and a loss in our hearts, we can embrace the everything. We can create a world that is fair and just a world where all beings are treated with respect and kindness, where we can all be free to pursue our own unique purpose. We can save our world. Einstein once said, a human being is a part of the whole called by us the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty.
Okay. I'm try to the host again. Sorry, um, Tiff. Oh, there we go. I'm gonna make you host again, Tiffany. Okay. Um, okay. I'm host. That that video is just so heavy. It's a little heavy. <laughs> so heavy. Um, definitely emotional. Uh, so we'll do some questions. I'm like shaken. Because it's I'm, just, well, it's I, so I'm hard sorry, to watch I, some of those things. I also, like, I appreciate that so much. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard. It, There's a lot of hard is. footage in there. But it needs to be seen. Yeah. Um, so I'll open the floor for questions. Does anyone? A, okay, go ahead. I actually have a lot of statements to make. I've been a vegan for a while now. Um, I actually got converted in a lot of ways while... My, my children abandoned dogs years ago, and then also um, Facebook, which, you know, social media has got a lot of downsides. It's causing a lot of problems in society. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Weber, and thank you for joining us for our What's Next in AI event. Wait, uh, what happened? A three-week virtual conference That's that we're okay. kicking off today. Someone playing that. Uh, uh, is it Thank you for joining us for our What's Next in AI. Uh, this is a three-week. You should be able to control the mute for everyone. Yeah, whoever's the moderator, I'd mute, mute that person. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, Tracy, I think it's your YouTube continuing uh, on. Three topics in AI. Oh. AI we can trust, AI we can scale, and AI we can reason with. <laughs> hey, that's probably a good video to watch, though. I am so sorry. <laughs> no, it's so okay. Um, I, so, no, don't worry about it. It's, it's, pro it's probably something I need to watch. Uh, <laughs> okay, so go ahead. I didn't, we didn't mean for you to get cut off. But I'm, yeah, involved, so sorry. I'm involved with Anonymous for the voiceless and DXC mm -hmm. and stuff like that. DXC is a little bit, I, I'm too afraid of getting arrested and stuff. But mm -hmm. um, like you were mentioning, and I hear this a lot, where people say, well, the disenfranchised, they get stuck in the, because I live in North Carolina, and um, mm -hmm. I go on vigils, they actually the last two months are just doing them on zoom but um in uh where smithfield is in tar heel mm -hmm. you know where they they mm -hmm. kill more pigs in this state than they do uh, in any other state except for iowa but anyway mm -hmm. we get to hear that we can hear them screaming and so on and so mm -hmm. forth and they kill i think like a million pigs every few days or something mm -hmm. um so I'm very involved in it and I hold up signs by myself and I'm big into gardens. Like I have a, I have a plot at the community garden. I'm big into that. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I just ha I take issue with the fact when people say, well, it's the poor immigrants, it's the this, the that. You know, I mean, Trump didn't come from a poor background and he doesn't care. So I don't know if it has much to do with that. I think it's more about if you if you educate people on being compassionate, as, as that lady, Brenda, whatever, I can't remember her name, one who puts her hands in the dirt, I'm big, into, I'm big into literally grassroots, like getting down. But the thing is, like, I mean, you can come at it from different ways. You can come at it environmental, for health. You know, I understand that some people are going to come at it at different, as long as they get there. But, um, but I just ha I I see these people driving the trucks and they're screaming at us when we're holding up signs and we're literally doing nothing and we're called terrorists mm -hmm. and people are thrown in jail and forgotten about. But the thing is, is that um, for one thing, we do have to fight. And I know every I listen to a lot of vegan podcasts that are really friendly and blah blah blah. But at the same time, how many hundreds of millions of animals a day are tortured and murdered? while people are trying to be friendly and by the way black people never got wouldn't have gotten their rights had they not gotten out and marched and unfortunately they some lost their lives they got sprayed down the dogs attacked them there's a lot of sacrifice that has to be made for these animals in the meantime 10 years from now half the species of animals are going to be extinct 
So mm -hmm. you can be nice about it and we can talk about it. And, you know, I understand that some people are afraid to do that. I'm afraid to go to jail. I don't want to go to jail myself. But at the same time, I'd rather, I, I don't know how much longer people can stand by while the earth is destroyed by overpopulation and plastic everywhere. It's in the, they found phthalates in the polar bears who, by the way, are starving and have no more, you know, the ice is melting. So, you know, um, and I just don't agree with the fact that I understand that immigrants come up, well, if you call them immigrants, this land was stolen in the first place from them, right? So they're really not immigrants. We're the immigrants. That's another thing that just Thanksgiving for what? For stealing land? But um, I, I, just, I just take issue with that because I grew up in a white I grew up in Northern California with white people who most of whom went to Harvard and Yale. Don't give a crap about the environment. Don't give a crap about animals. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily vegan. Like I haven't, I've met very few people who are vegan in general, whether they're Trump supporters or whether they've gone to Harvard. Well, of course he, he was well-educated because he came from money, but. So can, I'm sorry, can I interrupt you for a sec just to clarify? I'm not entirely sure I, you, I know you, you take issue, I'm not entirely sure, I guess, what point you take issue with. Like, well, I, I, I guess about, I, I... About the poor yeah. people, the disenfranchised, having to work in the factories. And I understand that they are, that they're a lot well, of them yeah. uneducated. But the thing is, is that I grew up around educated people. They don't care about animals either. Like, and you know, I think I, that the point, though. I mean, you know, the the point of my making the film was really right. It was to look at. It was absolutely primarily animal rights, and then by extension to look at animal agriculture as a whole. And I don't think that the. I. I mean, I. I my. My. Um, goal wasn't in any way to condone of course, any kind of cruelty to the animals, but just to acknowledge that the workers in animal agriculture are also exploited beings. Um, they are also having like, you know, their rights. And, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to, I mean, I think, I think what you're saying is that it's not a, that we shouldn't be comparing because the animal suffering is so egregious. And I understand that the animal suffering is egregious, but I think it's important to understand the totality of the industry because people who don't care about animals, they don't care about this industry, but people who care about human rights should care about this industry, even if they don't care about animals. Do, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, Let me interject. The environment so, um, also yeah, so we're going to um, appreciate uh, that exchange. I want to throw it on the floor for anybody else who has a question or a comment. There was one question on the chat that said, is there a higher percentage of vegans and vegetarians among religious compared to non-religious people, especially when considering Jains, Hindus, etc.? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just looking now at the... Um uh, at the comments in the chat. Um, so, and I'm trying, so let's see, is there a higher percentage of vegans and vegetarians among religious compared to non-religious people? Well, I mean, I don't, I can't, um, I don't have any numbers in front of me, but, but definitely there are a higher number of vegetarians and vegans among Jains, Hindus, and Buddhists than there are among the world's like Christian, Muslim, or Jewish populations. Jains are, uh, I mean, theoretically, Jains are vegan, and they actually go beyond what most of us vegans do, and they won't even eat root vegetables because, um, and I've experienced this, you know, you were talking about gardening, you know, when you garden, you often um, displace or harm little sentient beings in the ground, um, so Jains won't even eat root vegetables for that reason. Um, and Hindus, um, you know, something like half of the population of Hindus are, are totally vegetarian. Most of them, most practicing Hindu, a practicing Hindu won't eat cow, um, but they, they might eat other animals, but about half are vegetarian. And then I don't know, um, uh, again, I don't know the numbers exactly uh, among Buddhists, but um, there are definitely like many Buddhist communities, uh, 
vegetarian Buddhist communities and some vegan Buddhist communities. So the, the Buddhists in my film, actually every single person in my film that was interviewed was, is vegan, um, including Tashi Nima, the monk, and he's in a Tibetan tradition, but it's a, um, it's a, it's not the same tradition as the Dalai Lama. Um, and it's a vegan tradition. And then the monastery where I did some of the filming is in, um, the Plum Village tradition, which is the tradition um, uh, um, it's taught by Thich Nhat Hanh or led by Thich Nhat Hanh. And um, Thich Nhat Hanh is vegan. He's probably, you know, he's very sick. He had a stroke. He's not spoken in years now. I don't know if anybody is familiar with him, but um, he, well, I don't know, maybe 10 or so years ago, he has all of his, all the monasteries in that tradition. So he comes from the Zen, Zen Buddhist tradition and all the monasteries in his tradition, at least had always been vegetarian. But as of about 10 years ago, they're all vegan as well. I will say they're not like perfectly vegan. If you go to that monastery, sometimes you'll, you'll like go to use the salad dressing and it's like Hidden Valley Ranch. And you're like, hmm, that's not vegan. But um, they're, they're, you know, it comes from the top that they're supposed to be vegan. And they, they actually, they, I mean, I feel, you know, it feels like a very safe place to be. Un, unlike, I mean, for me personally, um, I, well, I, I grew up in a, my father was like nominally Christian. My mother was nominally Jewish. And um, um, my mom is now, if anything, Buddhist. And my dad, before he died, was definitely an atheist. Um, and I just never grew up feeling any real connection to my Judeo-Christian upbringing. Um, but I've always been drawn to the Eastern traditions, particularly Buddhism and the sects that do um, uh, see value in all sentient beings. And, but you know, some of them are really, like there's a whole Bodhisattva tradition that's where the emphasis is just all on reducing the suffering of all living beings and there's such an awareness of environment, there's such an environmental consciousness in that. So anyway, um, uh, I, I don't have the numbers, but I think that there are definitely more vegetarians and vegans in the Eastern traditions, unfortunately. And that, of course, it's, you know, uh, that's a generalization. And I know, I do know many um, vegan Christians and there are vegan Christian groups and there are Jewish Christian or Jewish uh, vegan groups. And I also know Buddhists who eat meat and Hindus who eat meat, you know, so. Um, but generally speaking, I think there is a correlation between the Eastern traditions and veganism, but, uh, vegetarianism. Does that answer that? I think it does. The next person that has a comment is Mr. Howard. Howard, go ahead and unmute yourself and speak at will. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so let me put out that disclaimer that uh, let me say that I'm a black sheep in this group here. And I just throw on um, a lot of points. Um, so the, I support the, the movie or the movement. Uh, one such thing that struck me is that about the quote-unquote animal right. Um, the, the thing is about animal right, and we say that we feel like we are superior than animals, so we eat them or exploit them. That is really not true at all. And that's because animals do eat animals. So like the eagle eat birds and fish. Mm -hmm. I don't think we say, why right, eagle, you cannot do that because mm -hmm. you eat at ascension being. Um, <laughs> it's more like a compassion in a way that we somehow human have extensive compassion to other animals. Mm -hmm. Put it that way, and that is a good thing. Not mm -hmm. the, not in the animal right as an equal right, but as a compassion approach. I think is much better choice. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that I want to put out is that we humans is omnivores. Uh, we don't just eat plants genetically, and so to also to say that animal uh, eating uh, meat is not natural, uh, that is wrong. It, eating meat is natural genetically for us. Mm -hmm. the, the problem, and also the problem is for vegan and vegetarian, mm -hmm. there's a studies, a lot of studies that if you eat that, you need to take supplements mm -hmm. because in the West, 
look at the shock history of eating vegetarian and vegan in the West, they, they don't know how to cook food or how to make food more nutrition and get all the nutrients they eat, like in the East, right, with history of vegetarian uh, food. And finally, it is more like a practice when you when you put a lot of video how animal cruelty in the farm is more like a bad practice um, than the animal right that we cannot eat meat. Um, and so I, want, I just want to make that, that extension that bad, bad practices in the uh, food industry, yes, it's very bad. Um, but again, going back to history, like the, uh, the native Indian here, the, I mean the native America here, they follow the buffalo trail and they eat, they kill the buffalo and they eat it, but they don't like put the buffalo in the cage and exploit them. That's a, that's a totally different. And as we humans become more overpopulated, um, the, the, there's this always a challenge when we get overpopulated. It's like uh, Dalai Dama say, on one said that one human is very precious, but we have uh, too much precious humans. <laughs> I like that. So, so this is not just about the animal rights, the compassion, but also the challenge that we face. And um, I think a lot of the animal rights uh, activists missing the point to, to, to look at the picture, well, like a whole picture of the challenge of the food industry that we face right now. The food desert is real. And you, when you go to a food desert, ask yourself, is it better to have a McDonald's or frozen meat to keep it long or have an apple, a fresh apple that will spoil in a few days? Mm -hmm. Over. All right, that's a, a lot of comments. Tracy, do you want to speak those? Um, yeah, um, let's see. I'm not sure. Um, I, let, me, let me see if I can. I don't know if I can dress all of them, but let me, let me give it a shot. Um, so um, uh, the, I think your first point maybe was that you think compassion is a better approach than like animal rights. And I, 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 I get that. Um, I, ha I did a talk at a um, Presbyterian church that has a um, vegan pastor. And well, actually I did a talk and she spoke as well. And um, we were, I wanted to do a talk on animal rights uh, like why Christian teachings, um, uh, you, or, you know, where, where we find called animal rights and Christian teaching. And she took issue that with that because she said, it's not about rights. It's about compassion. And honestly, I would say like my own, my own approach is it's very much based in compassion. And I think that's beautiful. I, you know, I, I think compassion is like the highest good. Um, but I also do think that there are justice aspects um, and it's not about saying that animals, that non-human animals are the same as human animals. Like it's not about saying that pigs are the same as humans, but it is looking at, uh, you know, I think that there's, we can look at like systems of oppression and structures of exploitation and oppression and these, these, these relationships in society where there are, you know, those with power and those without power, those who dominate and those who are dominated. And we can, and we can, and I guess I, you know, there's, there's some, I think it is still rooted in compassion, but there's also, there's a justice issue there. And I think that, that, that when we're thinking about justice issues and when we're thinking about systems of exploitation, it makes sense to think about the animals too, because like, why wouldn't we when, you know, if, if it's appropriate to, to think about justice with humans, then I, then, then I, would say it's appropriate to think about justice with animals because they also feel pain. They, they, I mean, they are the most powerless um, beings in our society. And so if we believe that we can use them because they don't have power, I mean, for one, that just goes against our basic view, our, our basic beliefs in equality and in fairness and injustice, but it's also like, 
I've heard people speak about, you know, that it's like training ground. And I think Will Tuttle, who's in the film, will talk about this, that eating animals, that, you know, what we do to animals, the exploitation that we um, uh, commit against animals, it's like training ground for exploiting other, other beings. Like we see these beings, the animals that are different from us and they, and they're, and they have less power. And we say like, oh, well, we can take advantage of that powerlessness because they're different. And if we, we, we train ourselves to think that that's okay, and it makes it easier to do that with other humans. So I, I really, I mean, there's nothing higher to me than compassion, but I do think that there's also like a place to talk about justice in animal rights. Okay, sorry. So um, let's see, herbivore, omnivore. Yes, biologically speaking, we are omnivores, right? But what that means is that we can, we can eat plants alone. We can eat meat. Uh, we can eat both. Um, there's tons of modern nutrition science that says that a plant-based diet is really the healthiest diet for us. Um, and I mean, one thing is like with the eagle, it's like the eagle doesn't have a choice, right? My, my, you know, the lion doesn't have a choice. Your, is that a kitty? Is that a cat? Yeah, your cat. Yeah, your cat doesn't have a choice. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but we do. So like, I'm not going to be mad at the eagle for eating a mouse, but I'm still going to be sad for the mouse. I'm not going to be mad at your cat for eating a bird, although I'm still going to be sad for the bird. But like, I have a choice. Um, and it's really like, it's a gift. It's like, it's this amazing thing that we have this choice. And so we can allow our compassion to, to determine what, you know, what we're going to, how we're going to eat. And then no, and then mo again, modern nutrition science tells us that we can be not just as healthy as if we eat animal products, but we can be even healthier, eat a whole foods plant-based diet and not just like a bunch of vegan junk food. Um, and the, in terms of, you know, the point about supplements. Um, so like, for example, B12 is one of, is one of the supplements that vegans need to take. But um, the vast majority of our population is B12 deficient because humans don't make B12, right? So B12 um, uh, comes from microorganisms in the soil. And when you eat animal products, like the animals who graze, they uh, consume that B12. Products. And then if you eat animal products, you consume that B12 too. But because most of our animal, you know, most animal products now come from factory farmed animals, they're not grazing anyway, mm -hmm. they're in factory farms. So they're B12 deficient. So when people consume factory farmed, uh, meat and dairy, which 99% of what's on the market is factory farms, they're also not getting B12. Um, so it's not like something inherently wrong with the vegan diet. It's just something, it's like we basically need to be eating dirt and we can either get that dirt like by not washing our carrots from the garden or we can, you know, if the animals are eating dirt and then we eat the animals, we can get it that way, but that's no more like natural. Um, and then same like beef, like vitamin D is another supplement that vegans take. But again, like the vast majority of people who live in um, the Northern hemisphere are, are um, vitamin D deficient. And it really is, you know, it's a major issue. So it's not just vegans. Um, uh, I think there was Sean one. Sean wanted to, oh, sorry. No, 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 I'm sorry. I, I thought there was one more point, but I can't read my handwriting and I forget the last Sean, point. you wanted to respond to Howard. Do you want to go ahead and respond? Yeah, a quick thought. Uh, I was vegetarian for 20 years, um, and I, I think I should move back to it after a few months of uh, thinking about it awesome. again. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, when I was doing some research, uh, it was way back uh, a long time ago, but there's one book here, uh, Becoming yeah. Vegan. Yeah. Um, and I had read the previous book, which was Becoming Vegetarian. And so to Howard, yes, we are omnivores. We have both bicuspids and we have, uh, uh, we have tearing teeth, both for meat as well as that. We are omnivores. And uh, as pointed out, we can eat a vegetarian diet. Uh, becoming, this book is really good because it, it, dis, uh, it bunks or debunks some of the myths about being vegetarian. And there's really good sources and citations um, in a book like this, these are by uh, uh, nutritionists and they cite like the World Health Organization and other organizations about being vegan. Um, 
And personally, after being a vegetarian for 20 years, it wasn't actually, you know, I didn't consume much dairy or many eggs. It was quite possible. And just in my own personal experience, I was healthy and um, I didn't, you know, I didn't have health problems with that. I think there's, you know, when it comes to the farming industry, as pointed out by Tracy, most of the abuse of animals is within that industry. And so choosing a diet that is, you know, as, as close to vegan as possible, if not vegan, addresses all the concerns about animal rights from the legality of that to the treatment of the animals to environmental issues to whatever else that's surrounding um, vegetarian, uh, sorry, uh, the treatment of animals. And so to, I know you had several points, but to, to talk about uh, being uh, an omnivore, we are. And maybe it may be that not everyone entirely goes entirely vegan, but reducing the amount of meat within our diet or leather or anything that requires consumption of animals. Uh, veganism is one way to address that in a very systemic way, like stopping eating or consuming any meat or, or animal byproducts totally, it gets to the root of the issue pretty quickly. So that was my address, uh, my uh, comment to Howard. Okay, thank you. And I agree, there was a Mr. or Mrs. Thomas that had a comment as well. Is she Thomas? Yeah, hey. Hey. How are it's, you? It's Ashy. Ashy. Um, okay, go ahead. So I had a I had a comment about the video. Okay. Uh, I think the video is really good. I think it covers the basis of most everything pretty well. But I would just uh, probably take out the part where you're comparing one animal suffering to another, because I think it kind of does the video a disservice. It, and I guess I'm, I'm trying to think like <clears throat> comparing the suffering of different species of animals or well, like I'm saying that the suffering of a chicken is in the industry is worse than the suffering of a cow in the industry because mm -hmm. you have no idea how how their suffering feels to them and it's equally important yeah I, I understand what you're saying I I think that the um, I think that sort of section in the film was designed to um, address the uh, a couple of a couple of misconceptions. So, for one, a lot of people when they are first trying to go vegetarian, um, specifically, you know, giving up meat, a lot of people will start by giving up red meat um, be, for a lot of reasons. I think because we have this idea that um, red meat is is uh, worse for our health and worse for the environment. So a lot of people will start by giving up red meat. But if you think about it, you know, one cow will 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 provide how many meals? I, 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 I'm not sure, a lot though, like hundreds or thousands of hamburgers, let's say, right? Whereas one basket of chicken wings represents like six lives that have been mm -hmm. taken. So yeah, but here's the like, thing. Oh, so, the sorry. Thing, here's the thing. You're comparing the level of suffering per animal against right. the level of suffering per another animal, where you could much better make your point by the amount of animals killed per meal mm -hmm. without having to pit the suffering against each other. Well, and I, I definitely it, wasn't trying to pit the suffering, but that's it's how also, it came off. Yeah, I, I, and I mean, and I appreciate the comment, but. Um, it's, it's, I guess just to explain it too, um, that maybe we didn't go into in enough detail in this film, but I mean, it's also based on the living conditions of the animals um, and, and other factors like genetics. So for example, uh, 9 billion out of 10, the 10 billion animals that we slaughter in this country every year for food are chickens. And most of those chickens, um, an overwhelming majority of those chickens are quote unquote broiler chickens, um, which is a which is a, a breed called Cornish Cross. That's yeah, what my chickens are. 
Um, and Cornish crosses, their whole lives are suffering because they have they are genetic monsters. Like we've done so much damage to them genetically in order to create the body parts that we want to eat. So like we want, you know, um, breast meat. So we've basically genetically modified these animals so that they have enormous um, breasts, basically so that they're obese and the, and their organs and their tendons and their ligaments and their bones can't withstand that additional weight. So they, in, in you, you saw some footage in the film, but you know, even when they're, they're set to slaughter at eight weeks old, um, but they, their whole lives, you know, they're kept in these dark sheds. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, I know I know all about all that. All I'm saying is there's a better way to make your point without saying that one animal's suffering is worse than another. That's all I meant. Okay, okay. so okay. I so we got that and I, she appreciates that feedback. I do want to interject when I, I was at Tractor Supply getting some stuff for the chickens and I saw those Cornish hens and they were just babies and they were already unable to stand right and right. i was just, i was just crying right. yeah because yeah. it is sad to be a little baby and not even experience your body or your body wasn't even designed for you it's mm -hmm. not even yours right it was just right. it was so sad yeah and i i think that people do feel really disconnected from chickens because i was like that i was like chickens mm -hmm. are kind of dumb Mm -hmm. uh, but then when I rescued some roosters not long ago, yeah. sorry, I get emotional talking about animals. Yeah. But I realized how, how unique they really were. Like, mm -hmm. I, I realized how smart they were. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyways, so I ended up getting three chickens and mm -hmm. they really do have very unique personalities. Um, and they were really little, like little bitty and they were in their little basket and they wanted to come out they wanted out of that basket they wanted to be outside so I would sit outside for like eight hours a day so they could play but even at that tiny tiny age they want freedom and they want to roam and they're excited and I just that just changed my perspective on chickens like I just I always felt connected to the pigs and the cows and it just seemed like they were more sentient but the chickens are too they really are so anyways, I apologize for being emotional, but no, please, I, and <laughs> personally, if I could just say like, don't apologize. I, I, um, I mean, that's just authentic and, and really, you know, how could you not be emotional when, you know, if you're really, if we're really, um, being honest about what we're looking at and what we're talking about, it's an immense suffering of these very innocent being. I mean, I know, I mean, I, I, um, I spend a lot of time like, you know, with my animals, like I'm very grateful. I feel like I get to focus so much like on the solution and not as much on the problem because I'm with all these animals. Like, my, my whole like purpose in life is to make them happy. Um, and there, and that makes me so happy to see them happy. And then I think about all the others that are living in industrial agriculture or, and I mean, and again, it's not just industrial because I know a lot of the backyard chicken people around here who, you know, they left their animal, they left their chickens in kennels during the um, hurricane and they drowned. Um, I mean, you know, you just hear things all the time. People who just, they, they don't think, um, you know, they get sick. Like we were talking about at the beginning, they get sick and people think that it's silly to bring your chicken to the vet. So they don't treat their animals when they have injured, you know, when they're, when they're in pain. Um, There's a lot of backyard chickens who are not living in good condition. Right. Yeah, I've right. seen it. it you're yeah. not supposed to be in a coop all day. Right. right. Um, so yeah, <laughs> just yeah. a tender subject. I appreciate yeah. you being okay with me being emotional. Oh, I, <laughs> I appreciate it more than you know. It's really, I mean, I really, uh, you know, like this film, I've watched it a million times. Uh-oh, watched it a million times as I'm editing it. And I still, every time I, I, I see the undercover footage, I cry. I mean, it's, you know, it's like you try to steel yourself against it. And I think to some degree to live in the society that we live in and not completely fall apart, you do have to steel yourself against it to some degree. And at the same time, you don't want to steel yourself against it too much because then like, that's how, that's how, what, that's why the problem continues is that, you know, most people do harden their hearts. And some of that I think is because it's just, it's so painful. If you acknowledge that these animals 
are, are, are feeling and that they're, that they're suffering in that mass degree right now, it's pretty overwhelming. And so I understand why people block it out. And it's that thing of like, you know, you, we, 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 we need to function in the world, but we don't want to block it out because it does the animals know, you know, you can't, you're not helping the animals when we, you know, there's a, so there's a Chinese proverb to close one's eyes doesn't ease another's pain. And um, that's true. So. so is there anybody else that has a question or a comment that hasn't written it in the chat I section? Craig has asked. Did Craig get to comment? I feel like Craig was asking to oh, comment. Oh, yeah, Craig, go ahead. Sorry. How y'all doing? Uh, my name is Craig. Just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, it was a wonderful documentary. I enjoyed it. Uh, Thank I you. I hope it gets out there. Many Thank you get so much. It. I appreciate that so much. I'm a, I guess I'm, I don't know, relatively new vegan. I've uh, awesome. been doing it since 2016. Awesome. Uh, been doing it since 2016. Uh, I never did get to practice any type of activism or anything like that. But, uh, you know, I believe that uh, that there's a spirit in all of us. And, that you know, when we uh, say you are what you eat. So if you eat suffering and, and you know, you fear and things like that you know you, you you put this type of emotion on these creatures and then uh you take that into the body as a representation of what's going to come out of you you know uh, so you know i just appreciate your group and then you know i hope that i can continue to participate uh, and thank you for your time thank you and i will say that if, if you are interested in memphis free thought alliance we have meetups and we do these lecture series every month. You can go to meetup and find us. You can go to Facebook and find us. You can also go to our Memphis Free Thought Alliance page and become a member. And if you have money, you can donate it. We do use it for this kind of stuff. Um, but more than money, we need people. We need hands. We need boots on the ground. We need people. So join us. Please become an active participant. And also, Tracy Glover has an organization, Awakening Compassion and Respect for All Sentient Beings. She has a micro sanctuary, and she can post in the chat. Maybe for Christmas, you can give somebody a donation to the micro peep sanctuary. In fact, Jason, if you're on here, if you want to give your loved one a Christmas present, donate to Tracy's Sweet Peeps. Ah, thank you so much for that. So, also, anyone else have any more questions or comments? We got about eight minutes, and then we have to start wrapping things up. Any questions or comments? Angry outburst? If you do have an angry outburst, I'll silence you, but that's okay. <laughs> um, and I, I'm just going to just as long, I, I just, so you know, I, I did just put in the Facebook page for the Micro Sanctuary, and I'm going to put in the link again to the film um and if anybody wants to share the film from youtube i would appreciate that so much like my distribution plan is just um totally grassroots hoping that it will touch people and people will want to share it um and i'm also going to i'll also put in my um website for my for arc for all being um yeah awakening respect and compassion for all beings um which and we is do great. have a memphis chapter it's just things have been slow with COVID. howard you wrote that you had a comment Yes. Um, so uh, thank you very much for for the for the feedback of my comments. Uh, one thing that uh, I still want to get touch um, is that the uh, overall industry of the food industry as a whole, not just the uh, animal side. Um, like Tracy pointed out, there's a lot of uh, food that's uh, lack of nutrients. Um, uh -huh. So, so it's the same thing for the base plant diet. Uh, we know that uh, organic foods have more nutrients than uh, uh, conventional food. And so on homegrown foods is way much better, tastes better. Um, so in a way is, is also the, we're talking about the industry here and not just the animal right, but the how the industry, uh, we as humans, uh, allow ourselves to do those same things. In other words, we go pursue uh, 
qua um, quantity, not quality, and in the way it's like destroyed the earth, um, like soy and soy and corn and other uh, vegetarian, I mean vegetables, they produce a lot, but they use they destroy the land, but because they don't uh, take care of the uh, the soil that they uh, that they grow the those vegetables mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. Hey Tracy, do you want to respond to that? Sure. Um, uh, I can try. I mean, I think that yeah, you're you're basically talking about like I mean we the, there are many problems in the food industry, and I think you know torturing the animals is a big one. Um, but right, even if we're eating even if we're eating plant based, we could still be eating foods that are being. Um, you know, I mean, for one, if they're processed, that's a whole, that's one whole story. But then even, you know, if we're eating actually like um, plant-based foods, we can still be eating all these plant-based foods that are coming from conventional agriculture, which is really destroying the soil and is unsustainable. And I do think that like, ultimately we need to get to a regenerative agriculture, a ve like vegan regenerative agriculture. So a, a whole, um, plant-based food system, but where our farming methods are um, sustainable and not killing um, the planet and, um, you know, not, not, not based in the use of herbicides and pesticides, um, which absolutely are, you know, they diminish the nutrients that we get when we eat the foods, but they also, you know, destroy tons of habitat. Like I was raising some monarchs here a couple weeks ago um, I planted some milkweed because we apparently have killed you know, have um, uh, killed off so much milkweed that the monarch butterfly is almost extinct, and that's mm. you know one little example of our exploitation of the planet. So I think yeah, to your point, like I think that there's we need to look at the whole food system and make it healthy for all beings, um, and the and the environment. Yeah, is that, that's so that cool. Is that oh, sorry. Okay, That's cool, cool okay. that you did that with the butterflies. I've got to, you've got to show it was me how amazing. to do that. <laughs> yeah, I there, will, oh. yeah. Plant some milkweed and then I'll, um, and I then will. I'll. I will, I yeah. will. And it's not a weed. Nothing's a weed. Sean, you have yeah. your hand raised. Is there anybody else that hasn't talking that needs to make a comment? It's just, just burning. I'll let, I'm going to let Kathleen go first. Okay, Kathleen go. Is there anyone else? Speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, so Kath, anybody else? One more time. Okay, Kathleen and then Sean. If anybody else wants to peep up real quick at the end, let me know. We got about four minutes. So, given that the veganism as well as vegetarianism only make up about not even quite 7% of the US population. Mm -hmm. How are you then going to bring over the other 93% mm -hmm. towards animal activism? Mm -hmm. Especially since within your, within your heavily pathos film mm -hmm. um, that even going towards buying meat at a small family localized farm mm -hmm. that may even have what are considered humane practices is not good enough. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think it's okay for, I mean, for one, I feel like, you know, for any activist, right? Like, I think, I think we all feel like we have to, uh, we shoulder the whole problem and we want to fix it and we can't. And, it, and, and so I'm very conscious of, you know, I'm trying, personally trying to do my part within a movement. Um, I think there was also a, just to link this, I think there was a question above um, um, or a while ago, maybe um, from Jason, I think. Um, and I'm not sure if this addresses your question either, but like about, you know, how will we get changed sooner? Will it be through laws or compassion or something? Well, I really think it will be through technology more than anything, honestly. Like there are so many advances happening right now in um, plant-based meat and dairy replacements, um, as well as like lab grown, like they just I, this week in Singapore approved lab grown chicken um, to mm. be sold. 
and that's it's all still, fun. yeah which is amazing it's still the pre, uh, it's still too expensive but that's going to start coming down exponentially and i think given that animal agriculture is so detrimental to our health so detrimental to the to the environment and to the animals um and you know the vast majority of people who eat animal products consider themselves animal lovers and they really don't want to participate in harming animals but i think they you know we we grow up eating animal products is just so normalized in our society and um they're just deep ingrained habits um you know it's very normal in our society and it's hard to break with those norms but so i think you know if you have plant-based um animal products lab-grown animal products that are um that are healthier for us um are don't have the environmental impact and don't harm the animals i think it's like inevitable that we will choose them uh, once the price point comes down and and um you know all the technology is uh and recipes are just um uh you know refined so that the taste is really what we expect and it's you know getting better every day like i don't know how much um how many of those products you've tried but like a beyond burger tastes so much so like so good they're so good I, too they're so good they freaked me out <laughs> First, at first, I was like, I can't eat these. And they just are like, it's so much like meat. Um, and then so I realized, like, oh, but I liked the taste of meat. That's not why I stopped eating it. So, um, and like, just egg, which is on the market now, it's like it's just like an egg. Um, and that's the same company that got their chicken approved for sale in Singapore. Um, so I, I still think though that there's like a place for advocating for compassion for all beings because you know we do exploit animals in so many other ways. And I just think as a world, we're really lost if we're not rooted in compassion and justice for all. So I still think it's important, you know, for those of us um, who are, you know, I don't know, we're, like that's our space or something to be um, working in it. But I, I think it's technology. Um, it's really going to do more good for animals and the planet and our health than anything. That's very hopeful. And one reason maybe I can stop hating technology Sean, yeah, <laughs> you have a comment and we're going to wrap it up with Sean because Tracy has to feed the chickens. So yeah, Sean, go you. ahead. Okay, quick question. Um, is the receptiveness of animal rights different in different parts of the U.S. or is it pretty much all the same? No, I think it's different. I mean, I think you will find, you know, community. I mean, again, I think it's, uh, what I think the biggest thing is, is I think tactics need to be different in different parts of the community or different parts of the country. Because I think, well, I mean, I do think that you, you know, there are animal lovers everywhere, but um, there are some like tactics that will work in New York that aren't gonna work in Mobile, Alabama. Um, uh, and I think that there are parts of the, the country where like, you know, hunting and agriculture are so much a part of the culture and the economy that it's a lot harder to get. Well, for example, where I am, I mean, so I'm in Lillian, Alabama, I'm in between Pensacola and Mobile. And it's about, as, I'm sorry, I make a face when I do that. When I, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's about as rural as you can get here. Um, and we're also on the Gulf Coast. So fishing is huge here, hunting is huge here, agriculture is huge here. This is a pretty, I think the South generally is pretty tough. Right. Although I think in the cities, you know, you get, I just think, yeah, the, I think cities are probably more, people in cities are more receptive um, to new ideas um okay. uh you know you, you look at like places like portland oregon and it's like i think everybody's vegan I, oh wow I, yeah. <laughs> really i didn't know that yeah wow. yeah, cool. yeah so yeah, i do think it's i do think that there's a lot of regional ver like variants i also think that there are pockets everywhere of people who are open-minded and you know compassionate and free thinking um, and I think it's like, I do think though that as, as activists, I think thinking about like tactics, I think it, it really matters the community that you're in, you know, and, and being just mindful of how people will perceive you. Um, like, yeah, because it's, it's so, you know, it's like, it doesn't matter what the message is if people hate the messenger or the way it's delivered which goes right. back to an earlier comment and, and, and I know we have to go, but just, you know, 
Uh, I think uh, we always have to be, you know, in any, whenever, any, whenever we're working for a cause, I think we have to be mindful about what's going to be effective and also staying true to our values. Yeah. I think that, so Thank you. I really appreciate you doing this for us. I think. Oh, I appreciate you asking me so much. <laughs> and I and will I, share that video as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I think a good quote to kind of end this on is everything has a price, whether mm -hmm. you're paying it or not. Mm -hmm. Everything has a price. Chicken mm -hmm. may taste good, but chicken paid, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. really appreciate everybody who came. Hope yeah. it meant something to you and spread the word, spread the documentary, donate to Micro Pete's, join, in, join MFA. Uh, bring us some more speakers um, and have a good day. And if I could just say real quick, just thank yes. you all so much for um, taking the time to watch my documentary. And um, I so enjoyed meeting you all um, and really, really appreciate all your comments. And um, you, you can um, stay in touch like through the sanctuary. I'm also on Instagram or through the Arc for All Beings or um, um, I, I think I'm on meetup, so you know, but so stay in touch and I appreciate sharing the film and just being being thoughtful, compassionate people. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.